someone asks about your thoughts on Google Plus's failure to compete with Facebook, um, and I guess we could maybe extrapolate that into just you know, the need once companies get to a certain size to say we need to have a competitive response to something new in the market, um, and why that often just goes really poorly. Yeah, well, it's, um, you know, I have to be a little bit careful on what I say on the Facebook context since I'm on the, on the board at uh, Facebook. Um, I would, I would, I, you know, it's hard to know exactly why, um, it's hard to know exactly why uh, Google felt compelled to do something uh, like Google Plus, it's very, you know, it's very, uh, very orthogonal to uh, Google's core business in many ways. Um, I would say that, um, you know, I would say one dimension in which Google and Facebook do compete very intensely is um, this question of which company is the coolest company in Silicon Valley, um, and it's sort of like a very odd, abstract uh, competition, but it probably does uh, drive things a great deal because it it, it determines, you know. If you have talented um, people getting started in Silicon Valley, would they rather work at Google? Would they rather work at Facebook? So there is this super intense competition uh, on the level of talent, and um, and I think I think there was probably some sense that, at Google that that Facebook was beating them on that dimension mm -hmm. um, for a variety of reasons, and that probably is what pushed them. But this is all very speculative. Yeah, but I think it gets back to a little bit of what you said in your talk, which is that. There are these certain markets that people agree are so big that we can't afford not to compete in social networking. We can't just cede that to Facebook. And so you choose to sort of have this wrestling match yes. and compete, often poorly, as opposed to why don't we just go look for another white space market, like let's find the next YouTube, you know, let's find the yes. next search it market. Gets very, it gets very difficult in a big company because once you're in a big company, um, all, the only things that move the dial are big things. And so um, if, if the great new markets start in our small markets, one of the mistakes big companies will tend to make will be will be to go after other you know big things uh, one way uh, one way or another. Uh, one of my uh, friends who used to um, advise Microsoft on M and A type stuff um, had this. You were you know he sort of described Microsoft as uh, you know it's like the it's like the Roman Empire under Hadrian. We've sort of reached the maximum extent. We have a few more good years ahead of us, but it's then just going to be this long senescence and decline. Um, and you know, of course, this is like sort of one of the top people at the company thinks this. And um, and then and then you have um, and then you have, but you know, the people running the company don't want to believe this, and so they want to keep doing things. They want to keep expanding. And so my main job in M&A is to discourage people from doing it. It's like the Roman Empire reached the maximum extent. We're not going to try to take any more territory, and um, and that, that, that would be the right strategy, but of course, uh, people don't want to admit that that's true. They want to fight, uh, fight the decline, and so um, they, they want to try to do lots of things. So there are a lot of dynamics like this. That, that right, I remember play. talking to Marissa Mayer when she was still at Google, and she was bragging about you know Google's 20% time, all these employees have entrepreneurial ideas, and they come line up outside my office on, I forget what day it was, Thursday, when she had office hours, you know, just like a college student lining up in the outside of the professor's office, and then they get to pitch their ideas to her, and some tiny percentage of those would get green lit and would show up somewhere on Google. And I was thinking, like, all the most driven, motivated employees are going to be, screw this. I'm going to go off and do, you know, do a great idea as a startup rather than try to get it through the Byzantine system. Well, there are all sorts of things that, um, you know, look, in, it's always an interesting question, why do you have startups at all? It's um, because, you know, what, because you'd say we have all these large existing companies. They have more resources. It's a safer place to work. Uh, they can have longer time horizons. Um, um, or you have large, you know, governmental institutions that have, you know, theor in theory have similar characteristics. And I think, um, I think the reason is always that the um, internal politics in large organizations get, uh, get strangely dysfunctional, both in a public and, and in a private sector. Where, uh, where if what's critical is to have original new ideas, um, um, in a large organization, um, you know, the ideas that get funded are ones that are conventional. It's like everyone, everyone knows this is a good idea, therefore we will do it. Right, they and, appeal to the management team, the management team can understand them, they so don't feel up, threatened by them. You end up with things that are strangely kind of uh, banal, and, uh, and the things that everyone thinks don't make sense, some subset of those are the ones that are going to work really well. So I think there is there is this uh, systematic uh, political challenge you have in uh, in big organizations that you know people try to come with all sorts of ways to overcome, but uh, it's it's it tends to be very endemic.